Hello and welcome to Truth Be Known, a show about how modern data leaders seek truth in an uncertain world. Today's episode features an interview with Tom Edwards, Chief Digital and Data Officer at Omnicom Health Group, the largest healthcare marketing and communications network in the world. Prior to Omnicom, Tom served as Chief Digital and Innovation Officer at Epsilon. Tom has been named one of the top 50 most influential business leaders in technology and a top 10 Global Marketer Award winner by OnCon this year. On this episode, Tom talks about transparency and decision making, how to organize massive amounts of data in order to drive insights, and how to determine the ideal communication strategy for a target audience. But before we get into it, here's a brief word from our sponsor. Truth Be Known is brought to you by Talent. A leader in data integration and data integrity, Talent enables every company to find clarity amidst the chaos. Talent Data Fabric brings together in a single platform all the necessary capabilities that ensure enterprise data is complete, clean, compliant, and readily available to everyone who needs it throughout the organization. Learn more at talend.com. That's T-A-L-E-N-D.com. And now, please enjoy this conversation between Tom Edwards, Chief Digital and Data Officer at Omnicom Health Group, and your host, Rob Norman. Welcome to Truth Be Known. I'm Rob, and I'm joined today by Tom Edwards. Tom, it is great to have you on the show. Rob, it's an absolute pleasure. Thank you again for having me. Yeah, absolutely. I'm super excited. And, uh, you know, I bet there are a ton of people listening who know you, who've heard of you. But for people who might not be so familiar, let's start with uh, just uh, giving everyone a little bit of background, starting off with how you kind of got into data, your first job, and then segue through to uh, your current role. So my name is Tom Edwards. I'm currently the Chief Digital and Data Officer for Omnicom Health Group. I've been on the cutting edge of technology and marketing since the year 2000. So I basically dedicated the last 20 plus years to finding that perfect balance between enterprise technology and advertising agencies. So my first role in data was actually, I joined Epsilon in 2014 as their chief digital and innovation officer. And it was primarily based because they had this treasure trove of data and they had these amazing assets at the time. So once I joined, I was able to kind of create a data design practice. Basically, how do you align data to insights and supporting strategic enablement of data? building out our AI practice, and basically redefined how we work with structured and unstructured data. And today, I am the Chief Digital and Data Officer for Omnicom Health Group. So my group is basically a center of excellence. We work across OHG. There are roughly 15 different agencies within the network that we support. And we support all facets of strategy, data, analytics, innovation. And we're basically comprised of a solutions group where we're looking at capabilities, upskilling talent, modernization, as well as a data and analytics team. That's really interesting because I think uh, a, a lot of folks, if they're coming up through the data role, they come up through more of an IT background. You've come up through the digital and marketing background, and now you have both the digital and the data role together. And um, by the way you're describing them, it sounds like you've got almost those two roles rolled into one, but you have underneath them teams that are dedicated to each side of, uh, of digital and data. Is that accurate or do you see it, is it slightly different? That's 100% accurate. Yeah, the way the teams are kind of comprised, you know, in the past, I've led digital strategy entities, really understand kind of the experience strategy side, and I started on the tech side. So I have a very strong understanding of, you know, technology. And then I've really bolstered the data side since 2014. So that's been a core area of focus and basically merging the two worlds. Like, how can you actually take an action data across an organization? I know we'll touch on that, but uh, you're 100% correct. Was that really important when you joined Omnicom that you wanted to have both data and digital together? Or was it just part of the way that the role was described to you? How did it come about that you were owning both the digital and the data? Originally, I came in as purely the chief digital officer. And what became really apparent, you know, especially how business has evolved over the last few years, we're seeing this convergence of experiences and digital and data now are kind of synonymous with one another. In order to craft you know, comprehensive experiences or omnichannel experiences, a lot of that starts with the data and how you actually apply that to you know, whatever the journey is, how we're gonna activate, what the experience needs to be. So it just naturally made a lot of sense to basically connect the digital and the data pieces together. And that's going to just kind of supercharge our work moving forward, especially when we start getting into the development of the AI practice. 
That sounds interesting. The development of the AI practice. Can you elaborate a little bit more on what that is and what that initiative looks like and where you see it going? Absolutely. So a lot of what I've focused on is how can we get the most out of our current data assets? And I know we're going to dive into what those assets are and all those other key pieces. To me, though, to kind of fundamentally transform the business and truly democratize access to information, we have to make the process automated in a way. So we have to get the most out of natural language processing. We have to get the most out of predictive decisioning. We have to get the most out of making information as easily applied to a business problem as possible without it necessarily requiring a formal analyst or a data scientist to parse through that information. A lot of what we do is really built around kind of strategic communication and kind of the segmentation of the individual, aligning behavioral insights into the right message at the right time. So being able to take and automate that piece, having AI-assisted workflow, and building out the internal infrastructure from an MLOps perspective to really reconfigure or supercharge how we're working with data instead of just having a call out of a data warehouse into like an application or something on those lines, what can we do to really kind of take and apply intelligence to the data sets? Like that's a big area of focus for myself and my team heading into 2022. And is that something that is applied to uh, for the benefit of the agency or is it ultimately for the for the clients that you're serving and as part of the, the platform that you offer your clients? Yeah, that's a great question. Initially, it's all about supporting the agencies and kind of strategically enabling them faster access to insights, faster access to, you know, mapping media behavioral data with consumer insight to come to a dynamic journey. Like that's a big piece of it. Ultimately, though, what I see, especially in the health and pharma space, a number of clients basically are moving forward with primarily their own first party data, especially outside of the U.S. So being able to take and enhance their data sets and apply intelligence and show them things that they may not know based on their own analysis of that information, like that's a critical piece for where things are going. So a lot of what I'm trying to do is future-proof the business while still kind of delivering against what needs to be done today in terms of accessibility and application and data fluency like across the organization. Yeah, and and um, behind that driver um, for what you're doing is to what degree is the cookie-less future world playing a role in driving that forward? Because uh, you, you mentioned their first-party data, putting this at the disposition of clients, um, very focused on the, uh, from a marketing perspective. So I'm a, I am I can hear underneath that, that it's one of the drivers must be uh, the cookie future of, of the world. Is that correct? Oh, you're a hundred percent correct. You know, being able to take and align, you know, whether it's through, whether it's through cohorts, but primarily getting to predictive decisioning. I, I used to joke around a lot. We went from content marketing to contextual, where it was high, highly focused on the individual and all of their, their data and how that applies. Now we're moving towards predictive. And another reason why we need to get to where we need to get to is to understand the type of content that we need to be creating in a cookie list future. What does that mean? How is that delivered? How is that still relevant to the individual minus core identifiers? So that's a big part of it. So you start getting into kind of content resonance, you start getting into behavioral profiles based on anonymous data sets and like pulling out specific trends over geolocation. There's a lot that can go into it to figure out the ideal way to craft, you know, an ideal communication strategy for a target. And for us, we work a lot with kind of healthcare providers and, you know, pharma brands. So it's a very small audience. So understanding the core nuances of each of those segments is like absolutely critical. That sounds like a, it's a fantastic initiative for, uh, for Omnicom. And I'd, I'd love just to take a step back and understand the, the data environments that you have that underpin that to support it. Absolutely. So within, within OHG, we have about 4,000 employees. And last April, we launched OmniHealth. So OmniHealth is our, within my group, within OHG, that is kind of our core data operating system. It's where we've aggregated 15 different data sets, everything from pharmacy to medical claims to message channel affinity, formulary information. You know, we're using different data sources, you know, whether it's Health Verity, IQVIA, AMA, MMIT, different kind of attributes tied to each of those. Um, 
then we really focus on how do we then align all of that information into usable formats. So within Omni Health, we've initially focused on the inside side. So whether it's building out custom audiences for patient HCP, that's kind of audience demo behavioral, audience sizing. But what the powerhouse tool that we really have is HCP Insights. That's where we're able to take all of these aggregated data sets and we understand by specialty, by diagnosis code, by tracking different types of prescriptions and prescribing behavior over time, location of care and market access. So we're able to very quickly parse through that information based on disease states and we're able to do different things. So we can enhance audience profiles, like really just understand the insights around HCPs, consumer consumption behavior. We can inform hyper-local targeting. So which markets have the highest share of prescribing behavior? We can link online and offline data to drive kind of the comm strategy piece, like the touch points piece. And then obviously we can understand kind of gaps and, and reach for optimization of media. So those are all things that we're really focusing on kind of behind the scenes for how we action data on behalf of our clients. So whether you're trying to drive medical education for an HCP or you're trying to go through and, you know, enable a field sales force to then work with those groups or medical education for physicians or real world clinical trials. There's so many different ways you can slice data to kind of support those experiences. And that must um, rely on a significant amount of data that you're extracting and, and, and passing through. Is it all cloud-based? Do you, do you have it on-prem? On what, is, what is the sort of underlying architecture and technologies that you use to support all of this uh, happening? Yeah, no, we, we have an event-driven architecture right now. And so we've got everything kind of built out. We have our data layer. You know, our information tech layer is you know, Amazon Web Services, S3 Bucket, you know, a little bit of Microsoft Azure, data management. We're using AWS Snowflake and Oracle. And as we're looking at retooling for our ML ops pieces, like tied to the AI initiatives, you know, looking at Databricks, um, ML Flow, SageMaker, Microsoft Design Studio Dash, you know, Dash, Tensor RT. So we're looking at all of those kind of components on kind of evolving our infrastructure to really supercharge for AI. One of the questions I had was, how data driven is your organization? But I but from what you're telling me, it is incredibly data-driven. Would you be as effusive or would you say that, well, actually, yes, we're on the path too, but uh, you know, there are still places we need to go? You know, definitely, I would say that we are a data-driven organization. Like when you start looking at kind of across our network of all the 15 different agencies, it's been a concerted effort, you know, really to drive access and education. Those are kind of the core areas, like how accessible is all of our data and information? How quickly can it be actioned on behalf of what we need to do? And, you know, continuing to drive education, you know, for those individuals. And so we've kind of cracked the code a little bit on this piece, and I can dive into that a little bit. So it, it always starts with the C-level, like having C-level buy-in for the various CEOs across the network that everyone's bought into having kind of a data-centric culture or applying data to drive the business. Like that, that's number one. Then it really comes down to how do we craft the educational material that's gonna create this common language and basically root everyone together to where we're having, we're all saying the same thing when we're talking about data. It's a really critical piece that most organizations don't take the time to do because a certain thing could mean something to one individual and something else to another. The third part is how can we build use cases that are basically tied to common business problems? So this really helps the individuals to understand the potential. If you're just talking about it from an arbitrary standpoint and you're, you're talking in theory but not application, it, it's not going to stick. And then another thing is to highlight the early movers. Who's actually doing things, recognize those individuals, feature them, turn them into expediters of adoption. Like that's a really, really critical piece that that's often kind of left off to the side. And you want to create a conduit for questions, like make it very, very easy for people when they're stuck to be able to have a team to go to an email alias or whatever else to quickly get whatever questions they have answered. And the final thing that we've done is we continue to affirm the approach and build new tools and solutions to make it even easier to apply data to business problems. So build forward momentum. 
So that's basically been kind of how we've cracked the code for applying data across a large uh, network of agencies. That's fascinating, and it's it, you've got those six points where you've you've um, you, which are your pillars effectively for cracking the code. But let's get super pragmatic. When you talked about the common language and you talked about codifying that, how do you pragmatically go about doing that? Is it documentation? What steps do you take to actually ensure that yes, with that mandate from the CEO, with that alignment there, how do you codify and get everyone speaking the same language? We create playbooks. So in order to create common definitions, and this is a process that isn't just driven from a single team, a big part of this is creating buy-in and acceleration through the groups in terms of how they're already currently working. So we can bridge kind of the current day-to-day to where we ultimately need to go. And that's another big component. Each time we have a large undertaking like this, we create advisory boards across whether it's digital, across data, across innovation, and pull in key team members who are really going to be the ones to help drive this through, drive adoption through their entities. So identifying those internal champions and then making sure, giving them, empowering them to feel a part of the actual transformation and the change, it's a critical driver to, to take it to that next step of, of actual action. And do you see the a lot of this is being driven by your stakeholders, or is it more that in fact, you know, you need these internal champions to go to your internal stakeholders to say, this is the art of the possible? It's a combination of both, honestly. Because what you're wanting to do is you're wanting to connect the the vision coming from the top to how that's practically going to be rolled out across those different entities and connecting the expediter to the vision and pulling that completely through and then going and driving towards quick wins. Like that ultimately is the the core driver of adoption. People have to see it in action. What is it actually doing for the business? How can this help me, you know, uh, be faster to market, you know, ahead of my competition? So those are kind of the key pieces that we're really always focusing on. And is that is that what you mean by the use cases? Those are examples of of, of how you're making it real? Yes, exactly, exactly. Just so you know, I understand and the audience understands, your key stakeholders are principally who within the business for these initiatives? Obviously, executive leadership across each of the agencies. And then if there's a core relationship with a client, so those client account leads, or we also have what's called global client leads within Omnicom, so GCLs. So they kind of own the relationship at a global level, and then there are different individuals, but down to the brand marketing level. So there are many kind of pathways in. So, and it depends on the initiative. So if we're talking about an internal, you know, approach to actioning data, that may be more for the internal leadership and stakeholders. And then we work towards a deliverable that's ownable by the agency. A lot of what my team does, we're kind of a center of excellence. So we'll provide best practices and standards and playbooks and guardrails and all those things. The agencies can take then and apply their their unique approach to the business on top of that and deliver as a comprehensive solution. Internal communication sounds like it's at the heart of really some of what you're doing. And I think, you know, every department in every company has a need for to, you know, to to be better at helping others understand what they do. But that really seems like one of the core tenants for your success is is through what you're doing with the initiatives, the internal champions, the documentation, internal communication, helping people to understand the art of the possible in a very reductive level. It's just really great communication. Rob, you're 100% correct. Communication is key. Making it easy and consumable is probably the other. There tends to be this, this stigma with data, digital, and technology that it's complicated. And in a lot of ways, it is. But one of the core things that you have to do to be able to truly drive adoption across a large organization and transform it is you have to make it consumable. So we go through a number of iterations and we actually pull in other team members to help kind of simplify some of the message. So that's another key component of all of this is you have your subject matter experts who can go incredibly deep, understand the vernacular and the terminology, understand everything about taxonomy and data hygiene and all the things you need to do. But at the end of the day, If it's not understandable across the various functions within the organization, from account to creative to service to strategy, you know, then it's then it's not going to it's not going to drive any comprehensive value. So that is a critical piece. The simplification is is key. Yeah, and and as part of driving that into and making that a reality, have you found that um, 
over time you've this has become more widely adopted but perhaps in the beginning needed to needing to partner with those who are in the line of business your internal stakeholders who are trailblazing to an extent and then f- therefore become like the those examples of this is what you can do oh I, now i understand is that is that how you're doing it? it it is like you need to understand who's influential within those organizations like who can basically drive this forward who do people look up to who are the ones that, that get get things done and that's who we look to partner with early and often to get their buy-in for what we're trying to do to help really accelerate adoption that's super pragmatic advice and, and, and really helpful. Um, let's, let's flip it around a bit. So in terms of the obstacles, um, talk me through any obstacles that you've enc- encountered in your pursuit of Omnicom becoming more data-driven. So from an obstacles perspective, there are more kind of external factors at play right now. So across the globe, you look at you know, all the requirements, you look at even what's happening in Brazil, you know, they're, they've taken GDPR and made it even more to the point where, you know, cross-border transfer of information, working across XUS data and XUS data sets in action, that is becoming increasingly more complicated over time. So I do think the days of kind of third-party aggregated files and being able to apply, you know, certain pieces, and they even have restrictions on how you actually action against anonymized data sets. So even taking and driving prediction off of some of those, there's limitations there. And so looking at how the regulations are going to shift over time, I think is probably one of the bigger threats versus kind of any type of internal adoption. For those organizations that are truly trying to transform and be data-driven, I always look at it through the lens of what are the data assets that we currently have in-house? So what's our first party data approach? And what are we ultimately trying to accomplish? Then what do we need to accomplish that? Do we need to subscribe to a third party API to fuel like an AI model, for example? So that's one of the core areas I'm looking at. You know, Internally, there hasn't been a lot of struggle. Um, everyone's pretty much on board, bought in, You know, as long as they're comfortable with understanding the value that's being created. You know, they've been very like complimentary in terms of making investment into other data sources and, um, you know, driving this message or this mission around refining our infrastructure to support kind of the next evolution of how we're going to action data. Yeah. And that, that, that must be one of the enjoyable aspects of, of being part of Omnicom is, is working with a team, well, working with a company who does get data culturally speaking sees the value uh wants to wants to use more of it um when you think about the regulatory and compliance challenges which is as you identified as one of your your obstacles for your company can you dig into that a little bit more in terms of how you are yeah trying to future proof the business or how you're trying to adapt to that ever-changing landscape and being in lockstep with what's happening there Absolutely. So we're very, very, very locked into what's happening from a regulatory perspective, both proposed regulation and what's actually being actioned upon today. And for us, it's really taken, you know, how we focus on even data acquisition and the standards associated with that. It's incredibly stringent. Obviously, we work in pharma, so we're incredibly aware of like any personally identifiable health information. We're also working with various partners to ensure consent and kind of those core standards are in place. So, you know, from envi- even from a data environment perspective, making sure that our data environments are HIPAA compliant and, you know, the escalation levels are appropriately set. So from, and, you know, our standard operating procedures, you know, are locked in. So we're ready from an infrastructure perspective, ready from a regulatory perspective. And now it's really about continuing to be basically able to adapt based on how the landscape is shifting and changing when it comes to, kind of data and regulatory but we're very very focused on it okay uh we're gonna we're gonna shift gears we're gonna move segments to one that i love uh, with truth be known which is under pressure what is the most difficult decision that you've had to make in your career or your current job and how did data shape that decision so In one of my previous roles, I was working on developing a comprehensive insights platform. 
while building out an AI practice, also building out kind of a strategic offshore team. So I was using a combination of onshore and offshore resources and the project just kept stalling. And I was trying to figure out why. So months began to go by. We're not really gaining any forward momentum. And when I really began to dig into the issues, some of the individuals working on the front lines, you know, especially on the data modeling and AI engineering side, basically said they could do things that in reality they couldn't do. And that was unfortunate because I'm a big team first guy, but I'm also very, very clear on kind of expectations. And I have one rule for all of my teams. It's, it's no surprises. Like, that's it. So unfortunately, we had to pull in a third party and scrap months of work, you know, because the team had basically oversold capabilities. So my learning from this is even though I really liked individuals on the team, I had to make the tough decision to pull them from the project and pull in other resources. And this even led to strive for the product manager, who was a really close friend, but it was the right decision for the business. And data, data didn't play a major role in the decision because data was at the core of the issue and like how we action and what we do. But then from a data perspective, you know, that's, yeah, that was, that was one of the tougher decisions that I've had to make in recent years. A tough decision and also a tough a tough situation to handle as a, as a leader in the business. Can you talk through a in a little bit more detail about how you went about handling that situation? Because I think that would be really interesting from a leadership perspective. It is. I believe in, in transparency as a leader. And I'm very big on empowering my teams, you know, giving them the freedom to, to create, to innovate and to do the things that we need to do. And, you know, very, very open to doing that. Um, I think what this experience taught me is especially when we're going into new areas and new areas of expertise to not just trust at face value when someone says they can do something. What this really taught me is I need to kind of verify the level of competency up front at times, you know, before we engage on a, on a major initiative like this. Make sure there is a bit of a proven track record or the ability to kind of provide this type of solution. And sometimes because we were also offshoring, there's kind of a cultural component to, you know, saying yes sometimes and really getting down to the nuances of having the ability now. One of the things I learned from this process is to make sure to have a senior lead of engineering um, to kind of validate and vet that piece versus just going direct from product manager into team without having that core architect to really validate those pieces. So that was a key unlock moving forward in these situations. And I've definitely corrected that coming into OHG. Hired just a fantastic AI engineer lead. Well, these sorts of situations are where we learn the most. And I think one of the things that you're mentioning is that, you know, part of it is going slow to go fast. Um, you mentioned in terms of vetting out in a more in a more granular detail, um, but also bringing on a trusted sort of right hand person who can who can who can be your point person. And, and and when you had to handle those tough conversations, how did you handle those tough conversations? You know, in a very honest, honest way, you know, give real feedback on areas where there were deficiencies and where kind of things were overpromised and, you know, not delivered, but always doing it in a very respectful way. Like I, I'm big on respect. I'm an ex-military guy. I'm very big on, you know, professional growth and development for team members and individuals. So, but at the same time, if we set a clear mission objective and we don't meet that, the criteria to hit that specific goal, and there's a deficiency, then we have to correct, course correct and move forward. And so that was, you know, you hit that, that threshold and that key point and you just have to make that shift. Um, that's really the difference, I think, from, you know, having an empowering leadership style and, you know, a, a, a close camaraderie in terms of culture. You can still have that, but have very clear kind of defined, you know, MBO set for how the team performs. And the expectation is we all kind of meet our expectation that we mutually agree upon. So let's segue to our deep learning segment. Let's talk about the, um, the best piece of a career advice you've, you've ever gotten. The best career advice I've ever gotten was to have a mentor and a sponsor. Like, it's so critical. When I talk to, to younger individuals who are just kind of embarking on their career, this is the number one advice that I give to them. You know, a mentor can help you navigate your career in your given field, but you also need a sponsor, somebody internally 
who sees the potential and the value and they remove barriers for you. I was very lucky early on in my career to work with individuals who, you know, saw something there that, you know, really caused them to invest in my career, give me opportunities for leadership early in my career. You know, I was a VP, I think by the time I was 20 and 20 or 21. And, you know, that helped to really accelerate kind of the executive path for me. So for individuals just starting, have a mentor and a sponsor. The other advice that I would give on that specific piece is your network is so incredibly important as a young individual starting your career. LinkedIn to me is the most valuable social network out there. You know, I I covet that more than any other network that I'm a part of because those are the individuals over the course of your career who can have the biggest impact. I'm always open to uh, helping others. People reach out all the time and they're like, they have a request or they need this or they need that. And I'm like, looking for this role, The more you give to your network, the more opportunities that come back to you. Like it's just a, it's something that's overlooked, but you know, I can't, I can't state enough the importance of it. Yeah. And so, and so are you saying then to, to get to a place where you have a mentor that guides you in a, in a similar way that, that you've been guided, then is, is in your mind is the first step not necessarily to go, oh, I'm going to go search for a mentor. I'm going to actually give first into my network and be open and, and, and give as much as I can. And through that, almost through serendipity, you'll find yourself uh, in front of a mentor who can, who can help you. Or is it more deliberate? Yeah, it, it's both. I think that, you know, if you're truly interested in an area of focus, you know, it never hurts to, to reach out and begin developing relationships with, you know, core individuals who you admire, but do it in a way that's, that's achievable. You know, if you admire Seth Godin, for example, or Jeffrey Hazlett or whomever else may be out there, you may not be able to just jump right in and ask them to be your mentor. You have to kind of stair step it based on where you are in terms of your career. So look for, you know, friends and family or alumni from your networks or somebody who can personally recommend you. I always look for that, like at least one degree of separation when you're initially looking for a mentor until you can kind of establish yourself and build out your network a little bit more. So that would be my recommendation. Brilliant. And sort of segueing from that in terms of who do you keep up? Who do you look to? Who do you listen to in the data space? Who do you tend to follow and uh, take advice or learn from? Yeah, there are kind of three people. So the first is Jeff Persinger. Uh, Jeff was the previous chief data officer at Omnicom Health Group. Uh, he's an incredibly talented gentleman. You know, He really set the stage for me to drive results out of the gate. And I'm grateful for the time that I had You know, when I joined the organization he was, you know, heading towards his next initiative, you know, retiring, but moving into kind of private equity and these other pieces. So I'm grateful for the time that I had with him. The second is Christina Kim. She's basically my partner in crime today. She's the chief strategy and analytics officer at OHG, and she's an absolute data rock star. So us combining forces has really supercharged, you know, the comprehensive how we craft experiences and action data across every facet of the organization. So that's been a great partnership. The third is an individual named John Dubois. Uh, He was the founder of an AI company called Oculus 360. Um, He's now a principal at Ernst & Young. And he's he's one of the most brilliant when it comes to how you can actually apply various types of AI and machine learning models to action large large sets of data. So he was really my first partner in terms of aligning that piece to drive kind of a business where he aligned his organization with mine and Epsilon and we really kind of drove it together. That's amazing. So less um, less perhaps um, thought leaders who are of multiple degrees of separation, similar to the sort of the Seth Godin, but actually people within your circle, you've had the opportunity to work with and, and, and know. Brilliant. I find that to be kind of the best approach. So that even comes back to the resources I use to kind of stay on top of everything. Primary research is incredibly important. You know, I track developer wikis and I track patents and I conduct primary research on areas of emerging technology. But I get the most value, not necessarily out of kind of third party or industry thought leaders. It's really the different team members that I work with across the network. Created a digital advisory board. And, you know, that team is instrumental in kind of sharing resources and information that's directly applicable to the business. And I'm a 
futurist and keynote speaker myself. So getting out there and helping to share information, like all of that is kind of how I do it. Amazing. And that's, that's really insightful and uh, very pragmatic. That's something that I'm noting down because I think that, you know, personally, I have a tendency more to look at the, the industry thought leaders and, and stay on top of what they're saying, but you're right. There's so much additional value that you can get in, in the main because you're working close with them or you know them and you can have that, those back and forth conversations, which is a, a richer dialogue and a, and a richer learning experience. It's a hundred percent true. And you can use those like third party thought leaders for the younger team members to form their own points of view. I do that a lot. I'll take, all right, this individual is talking about this topic. You as a junior strategist, give me your POV on what this actually means. And it helps them find their voice. So they're able to kind of connect to the larger, but also help advance their strategic development. That's great advice. Tom, this has been awesome. If people want to stay in touch, where can people find you, connect with you? I'm all over social as Blackfin360. So that's kind of my speaking platform repository, uh, all of my content from from all the years since I think 2009 located there, but across basically all major social platforms. Brilliant. Amazing. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure having you on. It's been so insightful listening to, to you speak. So thank you for being on the episode and for everyone listening, thank you for joining and we'll talk to everybody on the next episode. Rob, thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed the conversation and just have a great rest of your day. Cheers. Thank you. Truth Be Known is brought to you by Talent. A leader in data integration and data integrity, Talent enables every company to find clarity amidst the chaos. Talent Data Fabric brings together in a single platform all the necessary capabilities that ensure enterprise data is complete clean, compliant, and readily available to everyone who needs it throughout the organization. Learn more at talend.com. That's T-A-L-E-N-D.com.